So this is the third lecture uh, on the Risho An Kokoron, uh, and we discovered, didn't we, that the title Risho An Kokoron means thesis on securing peace in the land through establishing the ultimate truth. Thesis on securing peace in the land through establishing the ultimate truth. I'm going to lecture, uh, give this third lecture in two parts like we've done before with a break in the middle. So there'll be time for people to get up and stretch and talk to their friends halfway through. Now this amazing document called Risho An Kokoron was presented by Nichiren Daishonin to the ruling authorities in Japan on the 16th of July, 1260. 16th of July, 1260. And as you will remember, those of you who've attended previous lectures, it consists of ten questions and nine answers. These questions were posed by uh, a, a traveler who stays the night at the house of a wise man who is, of course, Nichiren Daishonin. This is the way Nichiren Daishonin presented this thesis. And they discuss the appalling state of Japan at that particular time in history. As you well know, it was a time of fearful natural disasters. Earthquakes, typhoons, floods, and epidemics. And at the same time, the country was on the brink of civil war. And to make matters worse, there was always the looming threat of invasion by the Mongols from the mainland hanging over the entire country. So it really was an incredibly grim time. So Nichiren Daishonin uh, makes the traveler pose these ten questions. And as I say, there are nine answers. There's no answer to the tenth question, because that by that time, the traveler is shakabukud and is able to give all the answers himself. So far, we've dealt with the first, answer, uh, first question and the first answer. And we found to our amazement that the chaotic state of 13th century Japan is exactly the state of the world today. Everything that we see around us can be mirrored in the history of Japan at that time. So every line of this thesis is relevant to us all, not only to us as practicing members of Nichiren Shoshu, but relevant to every single human being in the world today. This is the incredible importance of this document. And of course, this is why we are studying it. In a sense, you could say it's the validation for the urgency with which we must teach others the ultimate truth, shakabuku. We have to establish this ultimate truth here in the UK, just the same as our friends and fellow members are struggling to establish it at the moment in 91 different countries of the world. In these 91 countries, including our country, there are people like ourselves struggling to do the three practices that Nichiren Daishonin taught us. And through this, as another Gosho states, to open the eyes of the people of the world. There is no time to lose. We all know the world's headlong in a downhill plunge. And this plunge must be arrested at some particular point in time before it is too late. So as you know, worldwide we've just entered a new phase of Kosen Rufu. And just as in 1951, when Mr. Toda, the second president of the Lay Society, decided upon a great campaign 
to establish the ultimate truth in Japan, he first requested the high priest of those times to inscribe a special gohonzon for the headquarters of the Soka Gakkai. And in his request he said, this is to serve as inspiration in the universal propagation of our faith. And this year, or to be more accurate, just at the end of last year, at the request of President Ikeda, the High Priest Nikken Shonen inscribed a Joju Gohonzon, a special Gohonzon, for the coast and roof of the world, which has been established and enshrined on the 10th of December in the World Culture Center in Los Angeles, where it will remain until such time as a world headquarters of Kosen Rufu has been established. So this is a starting point for a new phase. The second reminder, of course, of the incredible new phase which we are entering worldwide is that this is the year of the 700th anniversary of Nichiren Daishonin's death. And world Kosen Rufu, to open the eyes of the people of the world, to put it in his own words, is the will and testament of Nichiren Daishonin. So as President Ikeda said in 1973, by the year 2000, we must have a peace force strong enough to hold the balance in the world and prevent it from sliding away any further. Strong enough to prevent nuclear war. Strong enough to prevent the destructive and negative force which is running rife at the moment. So as I said at the first lecture, there are quite a number of political leaders who indirectly, or in one or two cases directly, have said that they believe we can stave off nuclear war for 20 years. This takes us to the year 2000. This is the key time, and all of our hearts and all of our eyes should be now towards that important year by which we, followers and disciples of Nichiren Daishonin, must have achieved our goal in the rhythm of life as understood by those who are practicing. I just want, before I begin the lecture proper, talk for a little while about this vision or concept of Kosen Rufu in Buddhism. Kosen Rufu, of course, is in itself securing or establishing, securing peace in the land, through establishing the ultimate truth. That is Kosen Rufu. And to some of us, it may seem a very high-flown sort of ideal. Certainly to many who don't practice, it seems a very high-flown ideal. But in fact, it isn't. It's a concrete reality which each one of us is facing every single day, right now, in our own particular environment. In the Gosho, the true entity of life, Nichiren Daishonin said, only I, Nichiren, at first chanted nam myoho renge kyo but then two, three, and a hundred followed, chanting and teaching others. Likewise, propagation will unfold this way in the future. At the time of Kosen Rufu, the entire Japanese nation will chant nam myoho renge kyo as surely as an arrow aimed at the earth cannot miss the target. And in many other Gosho, he talks of Kosen Rufu, of the world, not just of Japan as in this particular passage, opening the eyes of the people of the world. When he says in this quotation, entire, the entire Japanese nation will chant nam myoho renge kyo this is a misleading word, but difficult to translate from the original Japanese. This means everywhere, not every single person, everywhere, in other words, in every field of society, 
throughout the land of Japan, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo will be being chanted. So as I say, this concept of Kosen Rufu, though it sounds incredible and difficult and almost unbelievable, is in fact highly realistic. Kosen Rufu is not the idea of everybody in the world chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. Buddhism's far too realistic for that. We recognize, don't we, in Buddhism, the existence of the negative and destructive force of life. And we know that that very force, that tug between negative and positive, is what generates the life force to propel life forward. So, of course, Buddhism can't possibly say that every single person in the whole wild world, wide world will be chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. So in the end, there will be three groupings, three enormous groupings or categories in the world itself. The first will consist of those who are actually chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo to the Gohonzo. And through this, they rid themselves of the three poisons which beset everyone's life in these times. These poisons which are the source of war and pollution and all the evils that surround us. And the second category will be the people who don't practice at all. Indeed, they probably don't practice any religion. And probably quite many of them couldn't really care less what's happening over their garden fence. And the third group are those who, as it were, are in between the other two categories. People who may practice other religions or follow other philosophies, yet because of their sincerity and their desire, their heartfelt desire for peace and stability, they can't help but acknowledge the greatness and the wisdom and compassion of the actions of those who are chanting Nam Myoho Renge to go to the Gohonsen. Therefore, they follow and support. So this last group is extremely important in the whole concept of Kosen Rufu. Sensei once called them non-Gohonsen members. We should never get angry or upset because someone is unable to practice. This is their karma. If you try your best and they still can't bring themselves to chant, keep them as good friends. In the future, without a shadow of doubt, NSUK's success will be achieved and judged not only by the number of practicing members, but also by the number of non-practicing friends that surround us. Now, let's look at Kosen Rufu from another aspect. If you like, turn the telescope round and look through the big end. At that level, we find the same three groupings. In every single one of our environments, and we each have a different one, don't we? Though these environments overlap each other's and other people's in an incredible way. But in every single one of those environments exists those three groupings, though if you haven't set out to discover it yet, you won't realize it. In family, in your workplace, in your club, in your community and neighborhood, the three groupings of those who don't practice and will never practice and those who will and those who will see its value even though they don't practice and support exists at this very point of time. But how do you know unless you set out to discover it for yourself? Each one of us is responsible for our own personal environment. Each one of us should be setting out to discover 
Who in that environment exists in those three categories of Kosenruf? Then Kosenruf becomes meaningful to us, doesn't it? Not some far distant incredible ideal that seems almost impossible, but something that's on one's own front doorstep. So this is why at the World Peace Conference in Guam in 1975, President Ikeda said, we must struggle to sow seeds wherever we go. Unless we sow seeds wherever we go, how can we discover the three categories in our own personal environment? Of course, nothing stays the same. Everything is always changing. The people in those three categories at this particular point of time will not be necessarily <coughs> the same in six months' time. Someone else may start to practice. Someone else may become a friend. Always changing. But if our determination is to sow seeds wherever we go and to live the UK, NSUK slogan of trust through friendship, peace through trust, then we shall discover and keep constantly related to that environment. And as many as possible seeds within it, within it will not only be sown, but which will actually begin to grow and flourish. So of course this requires effort, but fortunately for us, life force we discover the more we practice is limitless, inexhaustible, boundless, and because life force is limitless and will well up in us the more we use it, provided of course we're doing our daily practice of Gongyo and Daimoku, then this activity and effort is accompanied with tremendous joy. So let's start to take a look at our personal environment and to discover who in it exists in those three categories. Right, so far so good. Now I'm going to ask John to quite quickly read through the part of the Go Show that we've dealt with so far from the very beginning. There was once a traveller who, staying as a guest at the house of another, spoke these words in sorrow. Beginning in recent years and continuing even today, we find unusual happenings in the heavens strange occurrences on earth, famine and pestilence, all filling every corner of the empire and spreading throughout the land. Oxen and horses lie dead in the streets. The bones of the dead crowd the highways. Over half the population has already been carried off by death, and there is not a person who does not grieve for some member of his family. During this time, there have been some who, putting all their faith in the sharp sword of the Buddha Amida, intone the name of the Lord of the Western Paradise. Others, believing that the Buddha Yakushi will heal all ills, recite the sutra that describes him as the Tathagata of the Eastern region. Some, putting their trust in the passage in the Lotus Sutra that says, illness shall vanish at once, no old age, no death, pay homage to the wonderful words of that sutra. Others, citing the passage in the Nino Sutra that reads, The seven difficulties vanish, the seven blessings appear at, at once appear, conduct ceremonies at which a hundred preachers expound the Sutra at a hundred places. There are those who, following the secret teachings of the Shingon sect, carry out prayers by filling five jars with water, and others who devote themselves entirely to Zen-type meditation, seeing the emptiness of all phenomena as clearly as the moon. Some write out the titles of the seven guardian spirits and paste them on a thousand gates. Others paint pictures of the five mighty bodhisattvas and hang them over ten thousand doorways. And still others pray to the gods of heaven and the deities of earth in ceremonies conducted at the four corners of the capital and on the four boundaries of the nation. The ruler of the nation and the governors of provinces, taking pity on the plight of the common people, make certain that government is carried out in a benevolent manner. But, despite all these efforts, they merely exhaust their bodies and minds. Famine and disease rage more fiercely than ever. Beggars are everywhere in sight, and the dead fill our eyes. 
Corpses pile up in mounds like observation platforms. Dead bodies lie side by side like planks in a bridge. If we look about, we find that the sun and moon continue to move in their accustomed orbits and the five planets follow their proper courses. The three, three treasures of Buddhism continue to exist and the period of a hundred reigns during which the Bodhisattva Hachiman vowed to protect the nation has not yet run out. Then why is it that the world has already fallen into decline and that the laws of the state have come to an end? What mistake is causing this? What error has brought this about? The host then spoke. I have been brooding alone upon this matter, indignant yet unable to speak, but now that you have come, we can lament together. Let us discuss the question at length. When a man leaves family life and enters the Buddhist way, it is because he hopes through the teachings of the Dharma to attain Buddhahood. But these days, attempts to move the gods fail to have any effect and appeals to the power of the Buddhas produce no results. When I look carefully at the state of the world today, I see stupid people who give way to doubts because of, the na of their naivety. Therefore, they look up at the heavens and mouth their resentment, or gaze down at the earth and sink deep into anxiety. I have pondered the matter carefully, with what limited resources I possess, and have searched rather widely in the scriptures for an answer. The people of today all turn their backs upon what is right. To a man, they all give their allegiance to evil. This, that is the reason why the benevolent deities have abandoned the nation and gone away, why sages leave their places and do not return, and in their stead come devils and demons, disasters and calamities that arise one after another. I cannot help but speak of the matter. I cannot help being filled with fear. Thank you very much. That is the first question and answer. And today, we're going to deal just, believe it or not, with the first question, which is only a few lines long. So I'll ask John to read, uh, the second question, which I'll ask John to read now. The guest said, these disasters that befall the empire, these calamities of the nation, I am not the only one pained by them. The whole populace is weighed down with sorrow. Now I have been privileged to enter your home and to listen to these enlightening words of yours. You speak of the gods and sages taking leave and of disasters and calamities arising side by side. Upon what sutras do you base your views? Could you describe for me the passages of proof? Could you read it again? The guest said, these disasters that befall the empire, these calamities of the nation, I am not the only one pained by them. The whole populace is weighed down with sorrow. Now I have been privileged to enter your home and to listen to these enlightening words of yours. You speak of the gods and sages taking leave and of disasters and calamities arising side by side. Upon what sutras do you base your views? Could you describe for me the passages of proof? Thank you. So the most important sentence there, if you like to underline it, is, I am not the only one pained by them. The whole populace is weighed down with sorrow. I am not the only one paid by them, pained by them. The whole populace is weighed down with sorrow. So, I'm going to talk about this question that was phrased by the guest, the traveler, to his host, and uh, it's divided into four parts. In the first part, I want to consider with you the need for respect of the dignity of life in government and politics. In the second part, I want to talk about the power of jihi. Jihi, that is to say, Buddhist mercy or compassion. And the comparison of this concept with the Western concept of love. In the third part of the lecture, to consider the reform of society and, of course, the individuals in society through an understanding that life is eternal, which in turn gives us an understanding of our place and the place of this planet in the entire universe.
And the fourth part concerns our inseparability with our environment. That is to say, the great Buddhist principle of Esho Funi, the inseparability of man and his environment. This last point is fundamental to the first three that I mentioned. I am not the only one pained by them. The whole populace is weighed down with sorrow. So, of course, ideally, this would be the spirit and the feeling of the leaders of the world today. There isn't one country in this world where the people aren't suffering in one way or another. And the world is so close now that the sufferings of one country spill over and cause sufferings in other countries. So really, if we all, and especially the leaders, felt pained by these sufferings truly in their hearts, what a difference it might make to this world. Are our leaders really pained? Looking at countries like Iran and Iraq, Afghanistan, Cambodia, Northern Ireland and countless other places throughout the world. The problem is that the sufferings are so continual, so constant, so varied in their nature that we become totally numbed and mesmerized by them. Even take our own country. Tremendous unemployment is growing, as you know. I heard the other day the statistics for people who have mental sickness. One in ten of the population. We have, I think now, if not the highest, almost the highest divorce rate in the world. And countless other sufferings, even in this land, which still fortunately for us is free and reasonably safe to walk in. People get conditioned to this situation in the world. And of course this includes politicians and leaders in governments. We take all this as somehow inevitable. And it's true that Buddhism teaches that suffering is a part of life, but not sufferings that go on and on and on and get worse and worse and worse for the whole of your life. Sufferings are to be overcome. This is what Buddhism teaches. But the situation in the world today is that they go on and on, and they're never cured and they get worse and worse in the process. Quite some time ago, Mr. Toda said, the aim of politics is that everyone should enjoy life to the full in circumstances of their own choice. Great words, they really are, aren't they? I'll repeat them. That everyone should enjoy life to the full in circumstances of their own choice. It seems impossible almost to imagine. Yet it is not impossible if we can achieve the balance in the world which the concept of Kosen Rufu means. So of course, if we look back over the history of politics, the history of government, there's been an incredible succession of examples of cruelty, egoism, greed, selfishness, and this goes on today. This is due, of course, to a total lack of any sense of humanity. If we go back further in history, this was the reason for the rise of such things as the caste system in India, the feudal system in many countries of the world, ruthless colonization, and most of all, war. Always in the end, it's the people 
the ordinary people who must sacrifice themselves. Sometimes their lives, sometimes their happiness. Human history is a succession of wars. And as President Ikeda said when he was giving lectures on this particular Gosha that we're studying now, the scars of war carved into human life are never healed. In some of the lectures we've had so far, I've given some snippets from my own experience. But I'd like to say, based on that quotation, the scars of war carved into human life are never healed. <coughs> that I was born in 1920, 18 months after the end of World War I. And even as a little boy, I still remember how dazed and stunned people were at the incredible slaughter that had occurred in that war involving millions and millions of people. And as I grew up, they were sort of groping for a better way of life, groping to find a way to prevent that happening again. A whole generation had gone. My father, by 1923, had had a business go bankrupt due to the depression of the economic situation generally everywhere. In 1914, when the war broke out, his first business went bankrupt. And I know that these scars never left him. To the end of his day, he worried sometimes to a state where he was almost sick about money. This was the mark which those experiences of two businesses collapsing and in between the horrors of France. These were the scars that were left on him. And I'm sure in many of your families you could give examples of these scars existing now. Yet, when I was a small boy, my favorite books, if I had measles or mumps or whooping cough or any of those sort of things, my favorite books were ten leather-bound volumes of illustrations of the Great War of 1914-18. These books were all full of glory and gallantry. Nothing else but propaganda looking back on them. Nothing else but justification of war and the killing of human beings. Perhaps these had something to do with the fact that by the time I became 18, I decided to go into the army and become a professional regular soldier. I'm convinced that they had a great deal to do with that in my childish mind. Of course, before I knew where I was, the Second World War was threatened and then began. And this time it was my turn to experience it. Of course, there was danger and pain and exhaustion and all the rest of the miseries of fighting battles in terrains that were against one. But in the end, these weren't really the scars of war. Even though through malnutrition, my teeth started to fall out. But I still don't look upon that as a real scar of war. The scar of war is how it affects you in your mind. The scar of war is the emptiness that I felt, the absurdity of life, the cynicism. What did it matter what anybody did? What did it matter to try to follow the principles I'd had drummed into me by my parents when I was young. What was the use of the church? What was the use of religion? God was a myth. Either God was a myth or someone incredibly cruel. In other words, I was in a vacuum. 
And because I was in a vacuum, if it hadn't been that I had a strong sense of duty, I might have really gone to pieces. And I think many people suffered the same thing. These are the scars of war, and these scars did not leave me, I promise you, until I found the Gohonzon. So many years later, in the Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni Buddha says, people say, I came into the world to save the people. On the contrary, he said, it was the people themselves who called me. The people are crying out in their hearts, just the same as I was crying out and you were crying out, which is why you found the Gohonzon. It is because of this crying of the hearts of the people all over the world, that Nichiren Daishonin appeared in 13th century Japan. It's why the Soka Gakkai was born in 1930. And it's why the Gohonzon traveled from Japan to all those 91 countries of the world. So unless we really fight now, unless we Feel the pain, as this question says, and make this the driving force behind our efforts to teach about the Gohonzon to others. War and all the other horrors of life will go on and on and on, over and over and over and over again, just the same as we know our karma individually has repeated itself in our lives. And from this world, war will go on into space. The films our children see today are preparing them for this just as much as those illustrated books on the Great War that I used to look at for hour after hour when I was in bed with whooping cough. I was prepared by those books for war. Other, there were other influences that did it also, but at my earliest age, I was prepared. In just the same way as films are showing and preparing young people today. Does this make us feel uneasy, anxious? How can we stop it? It's an immense task. The only way we can stop it is by establishing the ultimate truth in as many parts as possible so that people look beyond their eyebrows and beyond the end of their noses and really start to look at the world from a new dimension and take action to change it. There are about seven million households who are chanting nam myoho renge kyo in Japan at the present time. This will increase as each year passes. Mahatma Gandhi totally changed India without one violent act. The means by which we shall change things will not be those means either. But it will be through influence, through people seeing the wisdom and compassion of what we do and what we say that others will follow and will influence our countries Ah, and the whole world. Numbers are not necessarily the answer. In some countries they are. For a long time now, President Ikeda has said about Europe that quantity is far, uh, sorry, quality is far more important than quantity. Strong members, members who will never give in, no matter what they encounter. Members who are sensible and intelligent. That good sense and intelligence being something that can't be denied by anybody. This is far more important than enormous numbers in a country of our nature. Though this would not apply to a country such as China. So we can do this, and we must do it. 
If we do it by 2000, so that our influence is being felt in every field of society in this country, then definitely huge numbers will follow after that point is reached. Of course, I can then go on to say we will do it because Namyo Horengekyo, which we practice, naturally draws up into our lives wisdom and compassion. Through this, we will more and more feel the pain of the suffering of the people of the world. So what is Jihi? Let's just examine that for a moment. Jihi, Buddhist compassion. Ji means nourish. Ki means sorrow. Nourish, ji, sorrow, he. This means to take away suffering and replace with joy. In other words, to nourish so that sorrow is replaced with joy. Nourish, when you think about it, means an act which enables something to grow healthy and strong and valuable until it's able to stand alone. This is what jihi means. So you could expand it and say it means to take away suffering and replace with eternal joy or lasting joy. Furthermore, jihi does not mean nourishing to one's own self-sacrifice. Jihi means benefit for all, for the nourisher as well as the nourished. Not nourish nourishment, which is followed by the exhaustion of the giver. In the last prayer of Gongyo, we say, Lastly, I pray for the Gohonzon's impartial benefits to spread throughout the world and bring peace and happiness to all mankind and the entire universe. Lastly, I pray for the Gohonzon's impartial benefits to spread throughout the world. This is the quality of Buddhist compassion founded on chanting to the Gohonzon. So what is the difference between this concept of jihi and love? It's not an emotion. It's not some ideal. Jihi is not in any sense like that. Jihi is a reality. Love is emotional, sentimental it can be, or even romantic. Whatever happens, it's always changing. This is like the waves on the surface of the sea. But Jihi is a fundamental deep current of Buddhist compassion which lies in everyone's lives and which can be activated through practicing Buddhism. So in other words, Jihi is the ultimate deep state of human life, a natural state, the product of Buddhahood. 